Welcome back to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Mr. Meek, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. I'm excited to talk about this subject because for the past two years, it has consumed probably most of my life. And I'm curious how you got interested in the JFK assassination. Well, um, you know, I was 13 years old, eighth grade, Elgin, Illinois. I was in shop class. And I remember somebody said, you know, did you hear the president got shot? I'm like, no. And so the next class for me was English. And... Um, the principal came over the intercom and, and announced to the school that the president had been killed. And, um, you know, that weekend, just everything stopped. Um, you know, I don't have a lot of vivid memories, but I just know that my family didn't do anything but watch television that weekend. And, you know, I, I was 13. I didn't pay much attention to it. You know, the next year, the Warren report came out. Uh, you know, and on the news, it was that this fellow, Lee Harvey Oswald, had assassinated the president. And I didn't give it much thought. Um, it was a little bit later in life, um, in my 20s and so on, when I got more interested in history. And uh, there was a movie came out in 1973 called Executive Action. And my wife went and, and I went and saw that. And I still have a little newspaper handout that they gave out. For some reason, I kept it. <laughs> And, um, you know, I thought that was interesting. And uh, again, just really didn't give it much thought. And two years later, as is the case for many, on March 6, 1975, Geraldo Rivera's Good Night America program was on. And I didn't know, when I tuned in, I did not know they were going to be talking about the Kennedy assassination. I tuned in because Raquel Welsh was going to be on the program. And she had just won a Golden Globe Award and, uh, you know, very pretty lady. So I thought, well, I'll see what that's all about. And then, you know, on came Robert Groden and, and Dick Gregory. And Mr. Groden had the courage to show the Zapruder film to the nation. And I was stunned. And Rivera said, you know, in three weeks, our next program, which was going to be on my 25th birthday, <clears throat> March 27th, we're going to devote the whole 90 minutes to the Kennedy assassination. So I borrowed my mother's little tape recorder and sat it by the television set and, and recorded that. And um, there were, I don't remember who all was on the program without looking. But you know, various people were talking about various aspects of the assassination. And it just, I was like, what? You're kidding. That's, I thought this Oswald guy did it. And so they mentioned some books. So I went like six seconds in Dallas, accessories after the fact. <laughs> and so I went to the library and I checked out this book and that book and so on. And um, in the back of those books were um, footnotes. And so I looked at the footnotes and I was still skeptical. So I wrote to Washington for the documents that were mentioned. And got them. And by golly, what these guys were saying on television was true. And from there, Robbie, it just it just took off. Uh, I don't remember how I uh, initially found out about Mary Farrell. Uh, back then, I would uh, I'm biased. I loved Mary. Uh, I would say she, if she wasn't the number one researcher on the planet at that time, she was really close. And so I wrote her, <clears throat> excuse me, I got a frog in here that won't go away this morning. Uh, I wrote her in September of 1975 and asked about coming down there and doing some research. And uh, she wrote me back a very nice letter. Um, it's in, I actually produced the letter in my second book, uh, The Manipulation of Lee Harvey Oswald. And she invited me down there. So my wife and I drove down from where we were living in a Chicago suburb, drove to Dallas. Uh, she was so kind. We had uh, set up staying in a kind of a flea bag hotel, and she moved us to a nicer hotel. And for a week, um, she shared documents and, and other things that she had learned. And also there at that time was Mr. Michael Eddowes, who wrote Khrushchev Killed Kennedy and later The Oswald File. He was also there doing research. He was the fellow that pushed for the uh, exhumation of Oswald's body because um, there was no mention on the autopsy report of a mastoidectomy, which Oswald had. And then um, Marina gave permission and they exhumed the body and it was that of Lee Harvey Oswald. 
So, I mean, while she was off to work, I was, she would leave a stack of documents on her kitchen table. And I just wade through that during the day. And then at night, the three of us would sit around and, and talk. <clears throat> and I went back the next year. I spent another week with her. And that's when I started doing um, interviews with Dallas police officers, and uh, Jesse Curry, uh, Officer Hill, um, C.T. Walker, um, L.L. Hill, and some others. Um, and it just it just snowballed from there. Um, I came up with a little bit of something on some uh, Oswald fingerprints that Mary thought was significant. And she talked to Penn Jones of the Midlothian Mirror, who did four or five volumes of Forgive My Grief. And uh, in his Forgive My Grief 3 revised, uh, Penn included that in there. And um, <clears throat> I just, it was just kind of a pit bull. I just kept digging and, and reading and learning. And uh, in 1977, Mary encouraged me to write a book. She was very complimentary. And she said, you know, basically, you're like a sponge. You've, you've learned so much. You should do a book. And so um, I did. Uh, in 1977, I wrote um, Lee Harvey Oswald, A Lone Assassin? Question mark. And I hand wrote it. <clears throat> You know, this is 1977 now, you know, and uh, I sent it to Mary and she typed the manuscript and sent it back to me. And so then the hunt for a publisher began and I wasn't having much luck with the big names. And uh, finally, I connected with a literary agent in Chicago who said, you know, this this has merit. Uh, but the FBI just released 96,000 pages of materials not too long ago. And so you'll need to go through that um, so we can be as current as possible. Well, at 10 cents a page, that was $9,600. And I was a, a teacher and a coach making about 12000 So that was the end of the book. And it sat in a box for decades. And when self-publishing became an option, and I, I had uh, previously published a book of World War II veteran oral histories, um, I thought, you know, I'm going to publish it. I wrote it a long time ago, but... I'm going to publish it anyway, because some of it's still relevant. <clears throat> and so I had someone put it all on a flash drive and digitized and had that printed. Uh, I think that was 2019. Um, may I step away just for one second? Yeah, I'll pause it. So in 1977, I wrote this and it was published in 2019. And I was the managing editor of the Hot Springs Village Voice newspaper uh, at that time. And shortly after I wrote that, um, I retired from that position and moved from Hot Springs Village, Arkansas, over here to North Texas. I live in Little Elm, Texas. And we moved over here because our son and his family moved here uh, to the Frisco area from California. That was October of 2019, February, March 2020. COVID hits and everything stops. And we were in a Dell Web community that uh, when it was all built out, would have 600 homes and there was about 30 here at the time. And so after working six, seven days a week for years, um, I was just bored to death. You know, that couldn't go anywhere, weren't supposed to go anywhere. There was hardly anybody living here. So I thought, what in the world can I do with myself? So I decided to write another book. And my first thought was just, you know, my family's heard me babble on about this forever. So I'm just going to write down what I think and, and we'll have it for the family. So I contacted my publisher, Del Garrett of uh, Ravens Inn Press and said, you know, I'm thinking about doing this and probably only be, I don't know, 30 pages or something. Would you even bother with it? He said, uh, well, sure. So uh, I floated some titles around. And I remember it was Bill Simpich that, that liked the title, said it was very appropriate. And so it was in 2020 that I wrote The Manipulation of Lee Harvey Oswald and the cover-up that followed. And the people who look at the book or see the book, um, the background is a letter. And that letter is from the CIA to me in 1978, January of 1978. And that's the cover letter that came with some very important documents that 
uh, apparently had not been out before on a French assassin, uh, Jean-René Swetra, which we could talk about down the road. So that was my second book. And um, then uh, in 2021, uh, a close friend at the newspaper bought the newspaper, the Hot Springs Village Voice, brought me back as assignment editor and correspondent. And shortly before that, every once in a while, I would just send something into the paper uh, about the Kennedy assassination. Uh, one of the earlier ones was I went down to the Texas School Book Depository and heard Howard Willens and G. Robert Blakey square off. And I wrote an article about that. And then, in, I don't know, a couple months later, I'd write another one. And the person at the office who had replaced me said that they were occasionally getting emails from folks saying, how come you don't have anything about the Kennedy assassination in the paper this week? And the answer was, well, Jeff didn't turn in something. So the thought was, um, would you want to write a column on the Kennedy assassination or on, on Kennedy once a month? And I said, sure. So we settled on uh, the column name of the JFK files. And um, so for one, once a month now, for about three and a half years, uh, at least once a month, I um, turn in a story uh, on the JFK files. and. A uh, fellow researcher and friend, Chris Gallup, uh, and I were talking one day. and um, JFK, it, the continuing inquiry. Yes, sir. That's right. He has a conference coming up on the 15th. Any listeners in this Dallas, won't be out by then. area? What's that? This won't be out by then. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> he said, Jeff, have you, uh, have you thought about putting these columns in a book? Because, you know, people never really know what week in each month your column is going to be in. And uh, it, it might be good just to get them all in one. And I, you know, I at first say, well, I don't know about that. And my thinking was, as soon as I write it, you know, I'm going to continue to write these columns as long as the newspaper will accept them. And as soon as I write another one, then the book is not complete because I've got the JFK files articles that are in there. But I thought, you know what, that makes sense. That would get a lot of information out because I've interviewed a lot of interesting people. And uh, so I talked to my publisher and shared that with him. And he said, well, don't let that stop you. He said, because if, if you keep doing it after we publish, then we'll just change the cover and add volume one. And so um, I took all these, most, not all, of the articles and the JFK Files columns that I've written. Um, most of them are interviews. Some are my analysis of, of different aspects of the assassination. And in August, uh, we came out with the JFK files. And uh, I was pleased, grateful to Mr. Robert Groden, who sparked my interest in the first place, talking about coming full circle. Uh, Robert was kind enough to write the foreword for me. I want to go back to something you said in the beginning when you said you interviewed some Dallas police officers. Now, do you, I use them and I've been looking at their documentation, but I use them as probably what wrapped up the case on Oswald so quick, whether it was the manipulation of evidence and things of that sort. I mean, did you notice anything suspicious about the Dallas police or anything about Jesse Curry or any of these individuals that you interviewed that gave you the tip off that there was obviously something not right going on with them? Only once. Um, in interviewing Jesse Curry, I was surprised to, to uh, at one point, quite in the opposite direction, uh, because one of the questions I asked uh, Chief Curry was, if you, if you had to do this all over again, would you do it differently? What would you do differently? And I thought, you know, I'd get, you know, no, you know, we did a good job with this and that. And instead, he said, um, and I can't quote it exactly, but it is in the book. Um, if we had to do it over again, we should have looked closer at the DeMoran Shields. And another thing that surprised me was, you know, I just cold called down to the police station and asked, is, you know, is Officer Gerald Hill there? Just a minute. And the next thing I know, you know, Officer Hill. And, you know, he had no idea I was calling. He had no idea who I was. I would introduce myself as Jeff Meek, I'm a, I'm a teacher, I'm 
uh, interested in the Kennedy assassination. I wondered if you would have a few minutes to talk to me. And almost all of them did. It didn't seem in a hurry. Uh, you know, I was new to things then, just a year or two in. So I asked about, uh, you know, and I can't remember the questioning, but, I, you know, I have it all um, in my stuff. Uh, but, uh, you know, I asked what I thought was was interesting and uh, made me curious. And um, there was only one officer that kind of cut me off, and that was C.T. Walker. We did talk for a few minutes, but uh, that was cut short. He didn't want to talk any longer. And then another officer that I spoke to, L. L. Hill, um, J. Gary Shaw, a uh, terrific researcher who's got a book coming out very shortly. Um, he and I were interested in uh, a certain aspect of the case, and he had done some digging and shared with me that um, in the police radio, they talk about a suspect down by Cobb Stadium and a license plate that um, referred back to an address and that address turned out to be fictitious. So we were curious about that. And on the police tape, the officer that went to down to Cobb Stadium and looked around was L.L. L. Hill. And um, you know, that's November, 1963. I'm talking to him in 1977 or 78. So I get it, it's several years later, but he, I was like I, I didn't do that, you know, and I didn't, I didn't press him on it. I wasn't going to argue about it. Um, that well, maybe he just forgot or he's not going to talk about it. But um, other than L. L. Hill and C. T. Walker, um, the rest of them um, were very open with me. Well, besides your interviews with them, did you investigate anything that Dallas Police was doing during the whole, you know? trial of oswald if you want to say that call that a trial i would call that more a persecution um when it comes to the evidence and things of that sort because there's a lot of suspicious stuff in there and a lot of it can be chalked up to like i know uh henry wade's conviction rates that a bunch of them got overturned later i think that's well public knowledge now but there was a weird way of how dallas convicted uh people and it seemed like there was a lot of evidence that did not stick or did not match with oswald as i said you know i was just a year or two into it at that time and um I've come to believe uh, and understand better since then of what a you know a terrible job the police department did and and just you know allowing all those reporters in there and Jack Ruby and just uh, just wasn't a very good investigation and you know I don't think I was all that aware of that back when I spoke with those officers. Well, when it comes to some of the events that are surrounding Dealey Plaza, based on the research that you have now or you know about now, I mean, what is the most suspicious to you? There's a bunch of things I didn't realize that were occurring in Dealey Plaza, not just the main mechanics of the actual shooting or motorcade route or any of that. But, I mean, you hear a bunch of stories. Roger Craig gets tossed out there a bunch of times with the Rambler and the station wagon. But then there's like a pool of blood that was in Dealey Plaza that I've heard get mentioned. And I'm like... Man, I don't know if it's just the world and you don't pay attention to the details about it, but it's never that exciting on my way to work in the morning. There's never a million things happening. Uh, yeah, you know, there's just, Robbie, I just think there's so much misinformation and inaccurate information out there. It's much, it's what's muddied the waters uh, for decades. You know, what is true? What isn't true? And as uh, I was talking with another researcher six, seven months ago, and he said, you know, uh, or I said, he said, you know, I wonder if we came out with something that was really definitive, would people even believe it? And we were both kind of like, probably not. And then just what happened last month, Secret Service agent Paul Landis comes out with his stunning revelation that he found a book, a bullet uh, behind Jackie's seat there. And a lot of people don't believe it. And so people do believe it. And um, I'm working on getting to Mr. L uh, uh, Agent Landis. Now, you're probably aware that um, I'm getting way off the subject of your um, question. We can go back to Agent Landis if you want. But su suspicious things in, in Dealey Plaza. Um, 
maybe I should be, but I'm not convinced uh, by those who say the Secret Service agents flying behind the knoll were not Secret Service agents, they were whatever. I'm not convinced that that's true. Um, <clears throat> there was somebody back there, Lee yeah. Bauer saw him. Lee I don't Bauer think it was an agent. I don't I don't think any agents left the motorcade, but someone was flashing apparently credentials. Somebody was. Um, you know, um Casey Quinlan and Brian Edwards have written a fine book about uh, oh, I can't think of his name right now. It's back here on my shelf of the fellow who uh saw someone there. There were people who saw people running away from the plaza or from the uh grassy knoll. There were people who saw a flash of light, a puff of smoke, uh, and you add that to the acoustic evidence, which um, some have believed they have disproven. I, I'm not one of them. To me, that adds up that there was something going on there. I was just down at the Texas at the Sixth Floor Museum Tuesday. They had a private reception thingy down there for the opening of a new exhibit. I was just down there Tuesday, and um, you know, you, you enter the museum. Um, from back there by the Lee Bowers Tower. And I just turned around and I'm looking at that fence and my wife and I are standing there and I said, you know, I just wonder what in the heck was going on over there because that guy in that tower saw people there, Lee Bowers. And so I believe there was someone there. I believe there was a shot from the front. I think the acoustic evidence supports that. Might not have been perfect science, but 95% and people forget or better chance of a fourth shot from the front uh, by the best um, acoustics people in the world at that time, Bolt, Baranek, and Newman, who figured out what was going on at Kent State. Um, you know, it wasn't some fly-by-night outfit that uh, figured this out. And so that has always kind of intrigued me, even though many people uh, don't believe that they were, uh, was anybody back there flashing credentials? Um, I believe there was, and they weren't, as you said, Robbie, then they weren't secret service agents. So what are they doing with that kind of credential? Yeah. I mean, it brings up a bigger question. Like I said, the pool of blood thing is relatively new in my area, but you know, when someone says that there was a person that was coming in for a gunshot wound, then you see Walter Cronkite and many others that were reporting that a secret service agent was killed. And those later changed. I didn't know he was killed. He was, he was injured. I think Vince Palomar has done a bunch of great work on that area. But that's just more suspicion, but it also brings up the possibility of obviously more than three shots or four shots, which we know from James Tagg and things of that sort. But the it leads us into the question of Buddy Walters. I mean, when there's this alleged bullet that was found in the grass, I do believe that something was picked up and put in a pocket. I think Jim Murray took excellent the fact that he took like consecutive photographs of this guy you legit see him put something in his pocket. I believe that. Uh, I don't know if that's been debunked in your mind, but I think that's. No, I, I'm a hundred percent on board with that. In fact, I, I'm presenting at uh, Chris Gallup's conference and at uh, JFK Lancer this year uh, on Buddy Walters. Um, I call it, call it Buddy Walters, a bullet found a house in town. And um, I'm convinced that he did find a bullet. Um, you know, the pictures pretty much show him digging around, picking up something. And I realized that in testimony, he never mentioned that he that he did find a bullet. But I can tell you, after interviewing his daughter, and that interview's in, in the newest book, um, he did find a bullet and he told his family he found a bullet and he told his partner, El Maddox, he found his, a bullet. And I think he told Roger Craig that he found a bullet. He told people he found a bullet. And his daughter told me that he wasn't too happy that he had to turn it over to someone federal. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so in 2018, I did a magazine for the Voice newspaper. I don't know if you can see it back there or not, but um, it was the 55th anniversary. So um, I told my boss, I said, if I can get enough interviews together, you, you want to do a magazine? She said, yeah. So we did. And uh, it was an insert in our November, um, I don't know, whatever, which, which or weekly, it comes out on Tuesday. I don't remember which Tuesday, but it was in November 2018. It was an insert in our newspaper. And I never heard 
from so many people in my life. And I've been with the Voice newspaper for several years. Uh, just really loved the magazine. And what it also did is it brought a few people out of the woodwork. And the reason I mention this is because I believe one of one of the people that came out of the woodwork may have uh, relates to this finding of a bullet. Mac Wallace. No, I'm kidding. What's that? I said Mac Wallace. <laughs> <laughs> no. Anyway, living near Hot Springs Village, which is a gated retirement community, is a little bitty town, Jesseville, Arkansas. And I went to the office one day, and there's a letter there from this guy. And he tells me he was a uh, police officer in the 1970s. And he's telling me a little bit of this and that about his training. And he gave me his badge number. Well, it took me a while to actually connect with him. And in the meantime, I contacted the Dallas police and verified the badge number of this fellow whose name was Mike Melson. And I'll, I speak about him in my presentation. And he's also in the book. There's photos in the book as well. And the most interesting part of the interview is when he told me that he was in, when he was in training to become a Dallas police officer. Uh, one day in training, these two FBI agents, <clears throat> excuse me, show the cadets uh, a picture. Tell us what you see here. We want to know what you see here. And Mike said, I remember he said, to a man, we said that's a spent 45 caliber slug and a, and a bone fragment. And they said, yeah, that's right. And so one of the cadets, maybe Mike, maybe somebody else said, uh, so where'd that picture come from? And they said, uh, that's Dealey Plaza, November 22nd, 1963. So is that the bullet? They also said, well, why do you have those pictures? And they said, just to, not to go into a whole lot of detail, but they said, for self-preservation. I'm not sure what they meant by that, but that's a pretty strange answer. Yeah, why do they got to do the cryptic stuff? Why can't they just straight up, you know, say what they mean? Yeah. Um, but that, you know, that... Does that relate to Buddy Walther's finding a bullet? I can't prove that. But it's the same uh, spent 45 that supposedly that Walther's picked up. I shouldn't say supposedly because he did pick it up. He told his family and others that he picked up a bullet that day. And if it, if it was, in fact, a pistol bullet, I mean, that that's big news. Now, do you believe any shots were fired from the Texas School Book Depository? Yeah, I do. Um, I forget what witness, uh, and I realize witness testimony can be a joke, but um, I do think someone saw a rifle being withdrawn, maybe as the person was leaving. Um, <clears throat> I think some of the angles work out right there. Um, and um a lot of the reactions from when people were immediately to turn around and, and look in that direction. So I do think there were shots from uh, the depository or at least back in that area, uh, as well as the front by the picket fence. Do you believe Oswald was one of the shooters? I do not. Okay. I'm not even convinced he was on the sixth floor. All right. I think he was probably on the, I don't know. There's a lot of evidence to support. He was on the first floor or the, close to the steps area, the prayer man theory. Yeah, I, I don't buy into that, but I've just bought Bart Kemp's book, Prayer Man, and I'm interested to read it and see if he can convince me otherwise, but I believe Oswald was in the lunchroom okay. where uh, the officer and Mr. Truly bumped into him. Now, with the, with the manipulation of Oswald, when do you think it all started? I mean, do you believe that it was a higher intelligence thing obviously with the cover-up and subsequent there's probably a lot of names here that can get tossed in dallas police a bunch of things but overall autopsy stuff that leads to military in my opinion cia type stuff but i'm just curious when you talk about the manipulation of oswald that you kind of wrote about do you go you dig back into his military um career and how far back do you go when do you think the manipulation started 1959 I believe uh, when Oswald was at Sugi Naval Air Station, 
uh, just outside Tokyo. You know, he was a radar operator that handled the U-2 spy airplanes. And I believe the uh, CIA pitched him at that time. They saw that he was interested in Russia, uh, which was pretty odd for a Marine. But um, I believe that it might have been Richard Case Nagel or Nagel, however you say his name, that actually did the pitching. Uh, and I think they uh, got him interested in, in at that time to go on a mission. Um, I became, uh, I first became suspicious of all that in 1976 when I interviewed Mr. Ron Crawley, who was in Oswald's unit. <clears throat> and uh, Crawley told me how the CIA was all over the place. And I asked him, were you ever asked for uh, to do any special assignments? And he wouldn't answer. The, the notes from the interview are, are, are in the book. Um, but it, it became very clear after talking to him that um, the CIA was approaching people for assignments. He said that Oswald would leave the base for two or three weeks. And I thought this was significant at a time. To me, that meant more than once. How do you leave a Marine Corps base for two or three weeks and not be considered AWOL? That's a good point. No, not going to happen. Well, he's speaking Russian in the base and everything uh, like that. Yeah, da, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I believe that's when he was trained. I believe it was kind of an easy pitch for him. They didn't tell him you have to go spy. You have to go. You don't have to go steal. You don't have to go spy. We just want you to go over there and tell the truth. You're a radar operator and know all about the YouTube. And that will be uh, that will send off red flashing lights at the KGB because the Russians have watched the U-2 fly over their country for years and they can't shoot it down. So they're going to want to know what you know. And so he goes to, um, you know, he gets a hardship discharge because a box of candy or something fell on his mother's face. And three days later, he's on a boat to Helsinki and says he's going to um, Albert Schweitzer College, which I'd like to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but, uh, you know, he, he ends up in Russia at, at, in the American embassy there, and he says he wants to renounce his citizenship, and I'm this, and I'm that. And I noticed that he never did renounce his citizenship. He never did follow through. And I, uh, I think it's uh, safe to say that the embassy was bugged. The KGB heard this. They became interested in him. Um, they put him in Minsk after he tried to, or maybe faked a suicide attempt to try to stay. Um, so I think that he went over there for a purpose. I think he went to New Orleans for a purpose. I think he went to Mexico City for a purpose. And uh, probably a purpose back in Dallas as well. Um, going back to Albert Schweitzer College, if I may. Yeah, can I just ask, do you think he sold the U-2 secrets to the Russians? Because within a few months, Gary Powers... Um, plane went down. I don't. And I um, had an opportunity last year um, to cover an event where Francis Gary Powers Jr. spoke. And um, he didn't, during his lecture, he did not bring that up, but I asked that. And if I remember right, he, he wasn't convinced that that was the case. Um, you know, that, that goes in, as you know, Robbie, this just, is like a spider web. It goes everywhere. And that gets into, you know, other false defectors and Robert Webster and Marina possibly can having met with, with Webster and he's a swallow. I'm telling you. Yeah. 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 Um, now it's I fine. If think, I say something, I don't, I don't think he did. I don't, I don't think he did. If I say something and you don't, agree with the theory that's fine i'm not going to be the one that's going to argue about it but i'm just interested everyone's got their own obviously yeah yeah no that's fine you know and i don't mind having conversations with people who disagree i'm you know i don't know everything i'm not saying i'm right but that's what i think that's what you know there's a, a book that came out recently and um it talked about what what is proof and proof is Kind of like the eye of the beholder. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Proof is in the eye of the beholder. What I see as proof, you may 
see as false evidence. And the author points out, Jerry Dealey points out that, you know, many times uh, researchers will hammer another researcher for, well, what's your proof? And they'll give them the proof and the per person doesn't buy it. I did a presentation um, on Buddy Walters in Allen, Texas, several months ago. And um, I just learned the other day it's had over 200,000 hits. And some of the back and forth with people, you know, trying to, well, you know, you're not, you didn't prove this and you didn't prove that. What's your source? So I would send them the source. I would send them the page in the Warren report. I would send them the page in volume, whatever page number. And well, you know, that could, that could be incorrect information. And I thought, you know, okay, uh, you have your thought. I have mine, but it goes to the point that what is proof? Proof is what, you know, I believe that Buddy Walters found a bullet. Other people don't. And so what I see is proof or what you see is proof, others do not. So there's always that that back and forth. Well, Penn Jones told everybody to find an area in the assassination and then research the hell out of it. With the initial point of coming together and uniting every single individual aspect of it and putting the pieces together a little bit, I would assume that would be the purpose. But the research community has become, I mean, from what I've understood, is a little bit toxic. That's fine. I get it. Everybody's got their own theories. And if you have a certain evidence that debunks that, then you ruin that person's theory. But I just think it's interesting because you can definitely say that it was not just a normal sunny day in 63 or anything. You can't. There's there's so much going on, so many connections. It seems like everyone was either a CIA informant or something of that sort where I go, it's not normal. And I think there's a... I don't know if that's all intended or it's just the various activities that were going on that people end up stumbling across, but it was not just a lone nut assassin in my mind, at least. And I think a lot of people agree with that. And I think the Warren Commission had it right. The Warren Commission said, based on the summary of the conclusions and evidence that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone assassin, I go, they didn't look for conspiracy. They didn't even bother. Within 48 hours, they eliminated the possibility of a getaway driver. And I think that was a serious concern because in the public's mind, that's the investigation into the president's death. And I don't think that's what it was at all. Yeah. And, you know, there was a lot that was withheld from the Warren Commission, too. Now, whether they would have used it or not is another story. And you had Alan Dulles sitting there on the commission who's keeping the CIA informed of what the Warren Commission is up to. And um, I believe um Gerald Ford was probably doing the same thing with the FBI. Yeah, he moved that back wound up six inches. Yeah, Do Dr. Ford. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, if I may, can I go back to Albert Schweitzer College just for a minute? Yes, sir. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, it's easy to ramble on and get off into tangents, isn't it, Robbie? It's a good, it's a good topic. <laughs> anyway, so he lists as a reason that he's going overseas, that he wants to attend Albert Schweitzer College in Switzerland, which he never does. But um, <clears throat> the assassination occurs, the investigation begins, and uh, authorities in America ask the Swiss officials to uh, look into this Albert Schweitzer College. What can you tell us about it? And initially, they get back uh, to the Americans that we can't find an Albert Schweitzer College. But we'll keep trying. And eventually they did. So if that college is so off the radar, how in the world did Oswald know to put that on his application for a visa? What was found out many years later was that Albert Schweitzer College wasn't doing real well, didn't have a whole lot of students, uh, could use some help financially. And so they formed a Friends of Albert Schweitzer College. And the chairman of the Albert Schweitzer College was a man by the name of Percival Brundage. And what uh, came out in the mid-70s, uh, when all the investigations were going on into the intelligence communities, is that, Aver, uh, that Mr. Brundage um, was also uh, connected to four other organizations that were all for CIA fronts. Told you, the connections, man, I'm telling you. They're everywhere. It goes, it does. It leads everywhere and nowhere. Nowhere to conclusion wise. It's it's why it's still uh an issue 60 years later. 
Now, do you think there obviously intelligence connections with Oswald, but do you think alone just CIA? Like doing obviously talking with so many researchers, people tell you some things and you can kind of find the evidence and put the pieces. But everyone, I which I probably don't agree with everyone on this, which is that it's so weird the loan department would just pay for Oswald's trip back. But I looked through the documentation when I was doing my little YouTube clips and they considered him a national security risk because he's making an incident at the embassy. I do believe that the issue and where I think conspiracy is the um, fact that he paid it off so quickly. There's only in a couple payments he was paying hundreds of dollars when the first couple were five or ten or fifteen dollars. And I think it was that moment with John Fain when he interviewed him in his car for two hours because they were more concerned. If you look at John Fain's testimony about Oswald's um, wife, if she was going to be contacted by the KGB. And I think maybe that's a potential moment where he became an FBI informant. Like I said, it's my own little perspective on that from looking at it, but I don't think he was just a CIA thing. I think it was more various agencies had their hands kind of making them do things. The CIA wouldn't have them do the fair play for Cuba committee stuff. That's a COINTELPRO um, thing that goes with the FBI. Yeah. And I haven't looked into the FBI as much as I have the CIA, but I, I agree with you that there's a connection there as well. Remember in, when he was in New Orleans and was arrested, he asked for an FBI interview. So yeah, there's, there's that. Um, where were we headed? Anywhere you want. Uh, oh, the uh, the State Department loan. Yeah, I think it was four hundred thirty-two dollars. Where do you come up with that money? Um, you know, when he's uh, arrested, what what is he doing with a Minox spy camera? What is he doing with binoculars? Wait, Tell us Minox light meter. That's what they said. <laughs> that's what the FBI. That's what the FBI wanted Officer Rose to change it to. And uh, Jim Mars did a, a great bit of research on that when he found out that the serial number on Oswald's uh, Minox camera um, proved that it was not issued in the United States. The, the number, the number on Oswald's camera, was not in that range of numbers of Minox cameras that were produced in the United States. So he got it from somewhere else, and I believe he got it from um, his handler, whoever that might have been. Can I Whether ask Richard Case Nagel or David Atley Phillips or George Morin Shield? Who knows? At Richard Case Nagel, I've Tom Samalock told me that he worked for the ARB, the Assassination Records Review Board. Who did? Tom Samalock. Okay. I had him on the show, and he didn't believe the whole uh, Dick Russell idea of Richard Case Nagel. Um, but I do think it's suspicious that a guy goes into a bank, fires two shots into the ceiling, and he starts talking about that. But I think he was talking about a different assassination attempt, the one um, at early September, not the uh, Dallas trip. Yeah. And there's a, uh, you know, it wasn't the only time that Nagel had himself somewhere so he couldn't be uh, implicated in a shooting. He, he checked himself into a mental hospital. Um, if I remember right, and I don't remember the month, it's been many years since I've read Dick Russell's book, but, you know, he did that twice because he suspected something was coming. And, you know, uh, is all the Nagel information accurate in Russell's book? I can tell he certainly believes it. And I mean, look, my goodness, the amount of research he did is outstanding. I'm on a panel next week on the 14th. With uh, there's three of us: Dr. Michael Chesser, myself, and Dr. David Montague, who was a senior investigator with the ARRP. Yeah, and I'm with him too. Yeah, I'm hoping to talk to him some about Richard Case Nagel. Ask him about the Clinton incident because he never told me when he was on here about that incident. It's the only it, out of all the files that he worked for to look at during his time at the um, ARB. Uh, is it, is it the ARB or the HSCA? No, it's the ARB. He's too ARB yeah, yeah he's too, Records Review Board. He's way too young to be in the HSCA. Um, but uh, if you looked at the, some of the files in the Mary Farrell site, some of the ones that are on there, if you click the links to them, this is file not found. And I asked him, and one was the Clinton incident, which I think Harvey and Lee talks about a little bit. But apparently he got an interview at a – Lee Harvey Oswald went to a mental institution for an interview uh, for a job. So I was just like, there's a bunch of things that – have not been at least i can't find unless it's in somebody's book and i'm like well this is just even the mary farrell site there's some paywalls there which i do appreciate the site having all the documentation on there but it's difficult because trying to get people interested in the discussion of the assassination 
And then next thing you know, you got a paywall or something like that. It's just, I feel too many people tune off, tune out of it, whether it's a conspiracy subject or not. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Clinton. Again, it's interesting that you do so because just yesterday for one of my future columns, uh, I had an hour conversation with Joan Mellon, who wrote Farewell to Justice and then did a revised version, which she sent me. And I just start, you know, I wrote, read her book initially, you know, 20 years ago. She sent me a revised version that came out not too long ago. And I just started reading it this morning. But we talked about Clinton and she talked to people. She did a lot of research there. And, you know, the the witnesses there described a, a person that looked just like Oswald. They saw them pull up in this car with Ferry and Shaw. Um, <clears throat> they followed him into the uh, town square and saw him, you know, saw them in Clinton. And you're right about Oswald apparently supposedly was wanting a job at a mental institution in Jackson and was told, well, you first got to be a registered voter. So that's the the reason he supposedly went up there. Um, I asked Joan, why, why do you think all that happened? And she said that was all part of the, uh, them uh, trying to implicate him to set him up so they could say that he'd been there. Yeah, I mean, if, as in like the Warren Commission could use that against it's like something of evidence of like he was insane. If you just said, oh, he was at an institution, that's how they would say it. I mean, when they used his discharge, they said he had been discharged from the military. They didn't say specifically what he was discharged for. If it was for something else like a mother getting hit in the face with candy, they used it as a discharge to kind of paint him as insane, a little bit unstable. People wouldn't ask questions. Yeah. yeah and, you know, again, back to Richard Case, Nagel or Nagel, however you say his name, you know, I think that's been some ammo used against him, too, that he was you know, traumatized by his military service and in and out of a mental institution. And um, that's used against him, just like I guess it, it might have been used against Oswald. Well, I mean, the man did say there was an assassination on Kennedy, and then we saw how that turned out. So, I mean, maybe, you know, asking for the Powerball numbers or something, I wouldn't be tossing him out of the water just yet. Yeah. Um, you know, again, the mental institution, the maybe PTSD that uh, Nagel suffered from his military service. It makes me think again about Agent Landis and his book, The Final Witness, that just came out in his stunning revelation of finding uh, that pristine bullet, nearly pristine bullet in, in, in the car and just not telling anyone, goes into the Trum room one, not sure what to do with it, sets it on Kennedy's stretcher and doesn't say anything to anybody about it. Um, I pre-ordered the book in June, but I had no idea what it was about. And then, uh, you know, shortly before it was published, as you know, uh, <clears throat> the research community, as you say, sometimes not really a community, um, just blew up with, well, he never said, you know, he was interviewed in 83 and 88, and he never said this, and he never said that. And, and so on and so forth. And so I, you know, I became pretty skeptical. And then there's the other side of the coin, you know, he's, he's 88. He's, you know, the, the end is out there somewhere in sight and he just wants to get the information out there and get something off his chest. And so do you believe him? Do you not believe him? And I was leaning towards not until I interviewed. In fact, that's my, my next column, which will print this coming Tuesday. Talk with um, James Robinald, who knew Landis somewhat, and wrote that long article in Vanity Fair magazine about the book. And he talked about how, first of all, he, made, he wanted to make it clear that no, uh, for the record, no, I did not help write the book. Uh, I got involved just out of the blue. Uh, Mr. Robinald is a historian. He's written four books. And he got a phone call from Landis's publisher, Chicago something press, something like that, um, which was the publisher that Mr. Robinald had used for some of his books. And for, for that reason, they reached out to Mr. Robinald and said, you know, we got this book, this agent Landis, take a look at this, see what you think. Well, immediately he was like, 
maybe you don't realize this, but this is really big. This is going to cause a lot of a lot of controversy. Uh, and you as a publisher, Mr. Landis, need to know there's some <laughs> there's some fire going to come out of this. Be ready. And so, you know, I asked him about not talking about this for 60 years. And he talked about how, you know, it was such a horrific sight, you know, the blood and brains of the president are all over, Jackie covered in blood, um, the, the trauma of it all. And, you know, I'd heard that argument before. And when we, either as we were talking or after we got done, I got to thinking about the two other books I've published, which are veteran oral histories. One is called They Answered the Call. World War II veterans share their stories. It's a book, 75 World War II veteran stories I published in 2011. And then just uh, much earlier this year, I published a second one with 85 stories in it called uh, War Stories, Oral Histories of Those Who Served with a chapter of World War II, Korea, Vietnam, the Cold War, and the War on Terror. And I have all these interviews. They're all preserved at the Library of Congress as part of the Veterans History Project. And in sitting five, six, seven feet away with a camera going and interviewing these guys who, you know, were at the Battle of the Bulge, who were at Chosin Reservoir, who were at Way, and all these, these battles, Pearl Harbor survivors, Battle of the Bulge survivors, uh, crossing the bridge of Remagen and so on and so forth. There were many times when these guys, during the interview, would just break down and cry. Or they would just kind of and like come back to life. I remember the, the one Pearl Harbor survivor who was talking about, he was in a radio room and <clears throat> all of a sudden, you know, boom, boom, boom. He's on the West Virginia and the ship's shaking and all of a sudden water starts pouring in a vent and in a vent. And while he's telling me this, he went like this. I mean, he could still see that vent. He almost drowned in that room before somebody got a hatch open. And so I became much more sympathetic to the trauma of all this. Because many of those men told me that they never told anyone about it. They didn't tell their wife. They didn't tell their children. They didn't tell their brother. They didn't tell their relatives. They didn't tell their priest, their pastor. They never told anyone until they told me. And I just have a knack, I guess, for people to, to open up. I don't, that's what I'm told. And apparently it's true because I've done a, a lots and lots of interviews. But, you know, some of even, um, it traumatized them so much they thought about suicide. Um, and, you know, I'm interviewing them, so obviously they didn't. But, I mean, just that really made me think back to how Landis could have felt at that time. You know, he talks about how he almost passed out, um, that it was such a horrific scene. And, you know, I can't do this. I'm on duty here. I got to protect Jackie. I, you know, I, I, I can't be passing out here. So um, with that in mind, I believe him. I believe that it was something he just couldn't talk about until now because I saw it in dozens and dozens of combat veterans. He has it in magazine clippings and stuff like that. He has talked about similar things to it. I just don't think it was to the extent of what the book has, which, I mean, it could be punched up for purpose. I don't know if I believe the claim. I don't think he's, like, doing it to sell a book, though. I don't know. I, I, I don't that. either. Um, Mr. Robinow told me that um, he's glad he did the book. He is aware of uh, all the criticism, and he's okay with it. He's He's glad he's finally got it off his chest. Clint Hill, I believe, does it to sell a book. That man's just he he attacked Paul Landis when he came out with his story. He immediately took to calling Paul Landis' story out and trying to book conferences and news things to do that. But I get it. It's just it makes it very difficult because, like I said, you got to think from like my generation and younger that who are disconnected from this time and they're trying to understand it. And I, you know, we didn't live through it. We don't really, we're very disconnected from it. So trying to see, you know, is this real? Is this real? Is that real? I don't know. I had to learn more context of the cold war, which, I mean, I was going to ask you, how much did you have to know about the context of the cold war and the times to really understand what was going on? I mean, a lot obviously wasn't exposed till later. 
Um, but there's so many operations going on, whether it's government and so much going on between different militaries of different nations that it makes it more understandable while certain things happened in certain directions that give more context to the situation. The assassination is not necessarily so much conspiracy. Well, uh, you're right. There was just a lot going on. And, you know, Kennedy was just at odds at every bend in the road with his military. Um, you know, he, as far as they were concerned, they, he failed him at the, at the Bay of Pigs. Uh, and, and again, a um, year and a half or so later at the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, they both saw that as opportunities to invade. He didn't. Uh, in fact, he's doing the opposite. He's He's got back channels to uh, Khrushchev and Castro to try to reach some sort of I don't know what the word is. Middle ground. Or not. Middle ground. Middle there ground. you go. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, you know, he he wouldn't get more active in Laos. He's pulling out of Vietnam. He just passed a test ban treaty. I think the military uh, establishment truly saw him as a traitor. And this cannot continue. The United States will not remain a dominant power. He is a traitor. He won't, he won't defend our nation. And so they killed him. Agreed. Agreed. I'm in the same boat. I think if you look more at like how many of these people are just either, I know people say following orders, but when you're like someone like Alan Dulles, he might be a horrible individual. But also if you read, like talk to David Talbot, who's you know done exclusive work on Alan Dulles, it reminds me a lot of like Sidney Gottlieb, who was in charge of MK Ultra. Stephen Kinzer wrote the book on that guy, and he said he just wasn't thinking of it like how normal people think of. Is this ethically right? Is this morally right? It's like, I got to do the things for my country that need to be done. And it's like that sense of patriotism, the blind patriotism, um, can really be a damaging thing to the people around you. And I think a lot of these people that were involved in this, whether it was covering up because there's a fear that if it was a conspiracy, then we'd have to go to war with Russia. All that has massive amount of weight to it. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Yeah, I would say so for sure. Yeah. I got to ask about one, one of the interviews you've done, but it's probably one we might disagree on, but it's the Ruth Payne. Yes. Uh, I <laughs> obviously have talked to Max Good and I've uh, had him on the show. I don't think Ruth Payne was a willing conspirator. I don't, I think. She, there's just she has some unanswered questions. I would ask I would agree with Nancy Weifert on this one, um, who believes that Ruth's not as suspicious. Michael Payne is because there is something in Michael Payne's testimony that lead me. Well, I guess had me believing that he knows more than what he lets on. And I think Ruth liked the spotlight a little bit, but I don't think she's necessarily this watcher of Oswald. Now, we can disagree on that. I just don't think she's this as everyone paints her out to be. I do believe she has some connections. But I don't think she's a willing uh, manipulator. I do not believe that Ruth Payne was a CIA handler. Okay, good. Uh, there's uh, obviously her sister Sylvia was. Uh, Sylvia Hoke was uh, involved with the CIA. Her father worked for USAID that did projects for the CIA. Uh, I've I've interviewed Ruth Payne several times, uh, and at the suggestion of Bill Simpich, she said, "This is what he said to me." He said. Ruth Payne trusts you more than any other researcher. You need to ask her about A, B, C, D, E. And I said, okay, I will. And so I contacted Ruth and I said, and I, Ruth, I know we've interviewed before, but let's do an interview that addresses all the allegations of you being CIA connected. And Ruth said, well, what would be the purpose of that? And I said, the, the purpose of that would be for you to answer questions about it and to answer your your critics that's, that are convinced that you're you were an Oswald handler and so she consented to that and those those interviews are in this book and it didn't convince you that she was anything more than just someone that was stuck in the path I don't believe she uh was in, was uh, a handler of Lee Hallandry Oswald I agree her her, her story has just Never changed. She's going to be down here in Irving uh, on the 20th. I bet that's the last time she comes to Dallas. So I'm looking forward to seeing her uh, again. We've emailed a little bit. and going to try to get together either a little bit before or after. We'll see what happens there. But um, 
Have you ever I, asked her about I, Michael I Payne? I don't. Very little. Very, very little. Probably something I should have asked about, but didn't come up. Um, <clears throat> I just don't, I don't buy it. And again, I'm not saying I'm right, but just, I even, and this, this, <laughs> This was almost a joke to mention this, but uh, it certainly doesn't make me anywhere near an expert in any way. But I watched a course online taught by a former CIA officer. And the course was on how to tell when someone is lying when you talk to them. And so I watched that a couple of times and I went back and, you know, like I say, I've got a lot, almost everything I've done is all, it's either audio recorded or it's on a DVD. 99% of it. And I, I did, again, you know, I certainly wouldn't even come close to being an expert on who's telling the truth, but I don't see it. I just don't see it. And her story has just remained the same forever. You know, it's much harder to remember a lie than the truth. And I, I don't think she was knowingly assigned to, to, to do anything. I think Ruth Payne is what Ruth Payne says she is. And I know there's a lot of people that disagree with that, and that's fine. But that's my opinion. Back to the course you took from the CIA person. You failed. My name's not even Robbie. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, I don't. I agree I with you. By, I can tell by your right eye. I, I, I don't think Ruth Payne was a I, – I think she has some things where her memory – like she, there has been an interview with her where she said she lost contact with Marina after the whole incident happened. And she made a statement saying that there was this – she never talked to Marina again or anything like that. Well, that's not true because there's mail that was getting delivered. The Secret Service saw her there when they were watching Marina Oswald. But that's a slip in memory. I don't think that's but I think, But I think she's talking about thereafter because we did talk about that. Uh, that you know they didn't you know after the hubbub of the assassination calmed down they did they did not communicate much and and Ruth said to me something like and I can't quote it, it it's probably in the book it is in the book uh, that you know we didn't have much in common really you know we had we had there was the assassination which was horrible and the raising of little kids you know what else was there really to talk about thereafter. I think our Warren Commission testimony was she was interested in speaking with Marina because she was interested in the Russian language. That's how they met anyway, yes. Yeah. I'm talking about the, the thereafter. Now, do you think that the Morn Shields are sus suspect? I don't really think so because they defended Lee Harvey Oswald during the Warren Commission testimony, which is something a lot of people might not know. I think uh, that he um, definitely kept the CIA informed of to a degree of what Oswald was doing, you know, uh, the CIA d uh, d domestic section there in Dallas, J. Walton Moore, it's my understanding, asked DeMorne Shield to keep an eye on Oswald. Uh, I think he did. I think he did report back to J. Walton Moore. I can't prove it. Um, but yeah, I think I think there's more to the DeMorne Shields. And one reason I say that is even that Jesse Curry believed that. The Warren Commission testimony of a brother-in-law or a relative, Paul Taylor, and, and the Warren Commission said, after a pause, said, you know, if you're going to do any more investigating, I'd look into the DeMorne Shields. And, you know, that could have opened up another whole can of worms about why. But, you know, they, they didn't go there. In, in in the questioning, um, <clears throat> you know, Gate and Fonzie and uh, Epstein were this close to getting him interviewed again, and he kills himself. I, I think there's more to George DeMorne Shield than than what most of us understand. There's people that believe that George DeMorne Shield was a CIA handler or wasn't a CIA handler. There's people that believe Ruth was a CIA handler or not a CIA handler. I'm like, damn, out of all the connections to CIA people throughout this whole thing, the freaking popcorn vendor at the Texas theater is a CIA guy. I'm like, come on now. I'm like the one area we're trying to figure it out. And there's, there's, I don't know. It's the biggest confusion aspect to it, but there's a, a lot to the case that is obviously suspicious. I don't think Ruth Payne or any of those people are, people you need to get 
everyone on the boat of conspiracy. I think if you just look at the basic investigation and what people would have expected out of an investigation into the president's death, you have that alone. I remember also in one of our interviews with um, <clears throat> Ruth Payne, she said nobody could handle Lee Harvey Oswald. So he's not the silent coffee drinker that the Warren Commission said he was? Say, say again? A silent coffee drinker, which everyone, there's like 30 different depictions of who Oswald is, so. Yeah. I don't know. She just felt that, uh, you know, he was his own guy and nobody's going to handle Lee Harvey Oswald. You know, and I don't agree with that. I think he, he definitely had a handler. And um, he was doing things uh, at the behest of the CIA and FBI. Well, I appreciate the research that you have done and the work that you have done um, for the research community or community with giant air quotes on that one. But for the younger generations, I think it's really, really important. Um, we're not so much on the forums. I stopped using the forums as much because it was a little bit hectic, but I think it's important oh, to have sick. all the... I think, yeah. I think you use the word, you, you know, and you're right. And, you know, I was deep into the research, actively researching from like 75 to 95-ish and then for about 20 years, I got into the World War II things and started preserving oral histories of veterans. And then when the documents started trickling uh, out in 2017 is when I really jumped back in with both feet. And where was I going with that? Um, but uh, the younger generation, you know, there's there's a lot there for them to learn. There's a lot there that they don't, they have no idea of. And when we shortly after we moved here in October of 2019, here being North Texas, about every three or four weeks, I was going down to the Sixth Floor Museum and doing some research in their research room, which hasn't reopened since COVID. Sorry to say. And so I'd be waiting in the lobby. You had to have someone walk you into that room because it's locked and all that. They have an extensive library in there and access to things outside the library that are kept there. And so I'm standing there in the foyer, you know, waiting for uh, Kristen Chanel to come get me, Ch Shania to come get me. And I'm looking in line and there's people in line to get into the uh, sixth floor to look around, see the museum. And most of them, in my judgment, as I was looking at them, they weren't even alive in 1963. So I was encouraged by that, that there's an interest. I mean, you are much, 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 much younger than I am. And you have a deep interest in quite a bit of knowledge about this. So I'm glad to see that. And um, <clears throat> I have a nine-year-old grandson. And I did an, a presentation in Allen, Texas on Buddy Walters and the house on Harlandale and the bullet and so on. And he knows that grandpa's into this JFK thing. And so we're sitting right here at my desk in... Uh, we're looking, we're watching the, the YouTube uh, of that presentation. And uh, about 10 minutes in, he goes, so Grandpa, he said, who do you think killed President Kennedy? And I said, Jeffrey, I said, I, you know, I don't know. I said, that's, that's an issue all these years later. We have some suspects, but we don't know. And we, you know, I don't know that my generation will live long enough to know. So it's going to be up to people the younger generation and even people like you to stay at it because there, there will be some other things that will come out. <laughs> and he said, Robbie, he said, don't worry, grandpa, I'll figure it out for you. <laughs> so I guess it's become a generational thing in the family. I hope. I don't even think it's going to be in my lifetime. It might be in his lifetime. Hopefully we get some answers on that one. But Mr. Meek, I appreciate the time you gave me to talk on my show today. Is there a place where people can find any of your links? And I'll make sure I link it in the description as well, too. Uh, you know, I don't have a website. I don't have any of that. I can give you an email address that people can email me. Um, you know, I'm fine with signing and mailing books. I'm, I can share some of my columns, some of my insights. You know, I'm uh, willing to help people who see what I know as helpful. So if you want, I can give you an email address. I'll link all your Amazon links. I'll probably won't put your email up there because there are some wackos. Um, That's but, true. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put, uh, and, and also the, it's the Village Springs articles. that Hot, Hot Springs Village Voice newspaper. I can link those in there too because I've read, I've read over those. So um, I'll link all those descriptions, um, all and those links you, in the description. 
Yeah. And if you have somebody that contacts you that wants to talk to me and you think they're legit and, you know, not some somebody who's from Mars or something, um, if they want to talk to me, you know, you know how to get in touch with me. So we can do it that way, too. Awesome. Thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Battle the Blank. Stay tuned for our next episode.